I want a clean <laughs> Anyway, we're going to have to look at that next year. Uh, but meanwhile, we're struggling, with, and we have an electric bill that, uh, for some reason, uh, they, they we were in arrears, and we didn't, I, as far as I know, we didn't get the bill. So uh, just we're just getting slammed. So pray about that. Make sure you're faithful in your giving, which you folks usually are. Uh, but we kind of might, you know, uh, back off on the emphasis of the billing program until we get caught up in our general budget. As far as the weekly average, we're running ahead of the budget and ahead of this time last year. So the, really the giving level level's pretty got good. It's just that we kind of got slammed here recently. <coughs> Uh, but God's faithful, amen? amen. He'll take care of it. I'm not, I have not lost any sleep on account of that anyway. So, all right, I think um, that's all I need to share with you at this time, so let's sing a song. Let's stand together, turn to 397 in your hymnals, 397. <laughs> up on the, our website now, right? The concert. But, uh, the concert Friday night, is that up on our website? It was on our uh, YouTube, right? YouTube. Yeah. No. But the, yeah, it's up on our YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. But the presentation, yeah, the, the, the question, question get in the <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
the bus, the bus seemed, seemed like, like it made it out, out all right, at least. <laughs> Open, Open up, up with, with me to John, John chapter, chapter 4. That's John, John chapter 4. Chapter four. We'll be, we'll be starting, starting in verse, verse 7. seven. John, John chapter, chapter 4, four starting, starting in verse 7. A woman, a woman from Samaria, Samaria came to draw water. water. And Jesus, Jesus said, said to her, give, give me a drink. drink. For his, his disciples had gone, gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink, drink from, from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews, Jews have, have no dealings. With Samaritans. with Samaritans. Jesus, Jesus answered, answered her, If you knew the, the gift, gift of God, God and who it is, is that, that is saying, saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord, for your just great love and grace and mercy. We're grateful again that we can gather here, Lord, just as a family of Christ. Lord, we're grateful, Lord, that we have you as our God. And Father, we ask that today you would help us to cast out distractions. And Lord, just help us to focus on you and your word. Help us, Lord, in just receiving your word and spirit and truth. And Lord, I ask that you would help me today, Lord, just to speak plainly, Lord, what you put on my heart. And the Lord, challenge all of our hearts today. I'll give the honor and glory for it all. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Here in John chapter 4, Jesus is traveling along actually he most people in this time period if they had to go through this area would have gone the long way around just to start this out just for us to get a little bit of focus of what we're reading here to start out here in John chapter 4 actually he does explain a little bit in the first couple verses but to suffice it to say where Christ from going to point A to point B in his travel he decides to go the short way and in those customs, in those times, the Jews would take the long way just to avoid this area. They had no dealings with Samaritans whatsoever. And so we find ourselves in, in verse 7, rather, where Christ has gone out of his way to go to a place where nobody would go out of their way for. In verse 7 says, again, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. That, right there, is pretty profound. Because the next is, Jesus says to her, give me a drink. See, a man in that time would have nothing to do with a woman in the first place in that area, let alone a Samaritan. So we already have something very profound happening here. But I want us to focus a little bit. I know John chapter 4 and the woman at the well is used quite often and popular, popularly. I believe that it's one of the greatest accounts of Christ in his ministry there is. There's a lot to learn from Christ in just this small encounter. But we find that Jesus interrupts the woman's task. He goes to her at her place of need. As we read along, we find what is she doing? That She's going to get what? Water. She's just getting water for her probably for her family or 
wherever else she is, but she's going to the well to draw something. She's going and getting groceries, as it were. And yet he interrupts her. You'll also note that it's done at noon. Less people that were around, probably, as we'll find later, for a reason. It was abnormal for somebody to be at the well at noon. They usually go in the morning. The heat of the sun is upon people at that time. They go in the morning where it's cooler. Plus, there's other things to do. you got to start the day with everything you need, and that was primarily what you would need is the well water. And so Christ, again, has come to a woman who is obviously out of place, a woman who, again, in that time period was rejected already being a Samaritan, and he points out to her something that she is clueless about. He says, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman, follow with me in, in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Again, just emphasizing her confusion of why he is bothering her. Why are you coming to me? You have no dealings with me. In verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Again, what I want to point is Jesus pointing that she really is clueless to what she really needs. He says, if you really would know what you need, you would have asked me for it. And that's the reason why he's there. I think about this in my own life. How many times has Jesus come into our lives as Christians and interrupts what we think is important, right? We may be going through life and thinking that, well, it's important for me to work. It's important for me to be helpful, even. I know there was a time that I, using myself as an example, I had several different churches at the time I was trying to help. Music ministry and other things, and the, here at this church. And you know what I found? You actually can be split too much. In your zeal to helping God, sometimes you forget really what's important, and sometimes you're not very helpful at all. It's important to want to be helpful. It's important to want to work for the kingdom of God, but it's also important to keep the things important in mind. Family. If I'm not there for my family, I'm not helping God. I'm actually doing exactly what he tells me not to be. I know, again, using myself as an example, probably because it's the easiest way to do it. I, In my zeal for working for God and trying to help God, I, I realized that my family was suffering for it. And that is not something God asks of us. He does ask for us to work hard for him, but he also asks us to love our family and to keep them first as well, because that's what honors God. Again, going back to, to work, some of us, we go, oh, I've got to provide for my family. I've got to. I've got to have the funds so they can have a better life. But in our want for a better life for our loved ones and our children, a lot of times we don't realize we're not helping them at all. At the end of the day, it's not money and provisions that necessarily keep things going. It's just our presence our guidance. Again, how am I supposed to disciple my ch children and my family if I'm not there? Again, I find that sometimes God has to interrupt my life to point these things out. How many times in my life where I am walking along life's road and I'm thinking I'm doing whatever important work may be for him and he has to stop me on the side of the road to say, Colton, we really need to talk this out. Sometimes you're asleep in the dead of night and you don't think there's a problem whatsoever, but then you're waking up and you have no clue why you're up. It happens again and again and you're finding yourself in a place where you're saying, all right, God, why am I up? And boy, does he have a good way of answering it, doesn't he? Whether you go to his word or in prayer, he usually has a way of putting on your heart and putting it clear. 
But again, I find that God has a way of interrupting our lives and coming to our place of need. What about the most important one? When our lives were interrupted before we knew Christ. May have been a long time for some of us. And in fact, a lot of times as Christians, we forget what our state was before Christ. I think it's important for us to remember that. I believe it's very important for us to remember that because that's actually the power for others to see when you see the power of Christ working in our lives and the transformation that he had in our lives as a witness and a testimony to them to see that there's a source to the way we should or hopefully we ought and we are living. Again, I remember a time in my life when Christ interrupted me when I was still yet a sinner. When somebody else took the time for Christ to interrupt my life. And so today I'm using this as I have read through John chapter 4 here. I see such a great example of witnessing. See, John chapter 4 There is a great example for us as Christians that we can use to witness to others and to help see the format, to see how Christ did it. Again, who's a better example, right? If I want to be successful, and again, I'm not saying, well, it's all on you. In fact, I was just talking a little bit ago about how the fact that I know we have a burden for our children. You look sometimes around and you wonder, are they even listening? Do they even care about the things of Christ? Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. But I can tell you from my own personal story, if anybody can be turned around like I was, I know they can too. See, it's not in our power. It's in Christ's power. And I want to, again, we're going to read through this. We're going to find a little bit more on this. But again, people are clueless about their real need, that they really have an emptiness and a thirst. Again, go back before you were saved. You probably really didn't know that you had a real need, did you? I know I didn't. You chased after things that were not valuable at all. And yet you were still hungry for those things. It never satisfied you. For the Christian... It is our job, actually, to reveal or point out this need as well and to get people to just stop and question. See, that's what Christ did, didn't he? He got the woman at the well here, the Samaritan woman, to stop and question what it really was she needed. And because of her realization that there is a need, the woman asks and searches for the source. See, there's something different about Jesus, isn't there? And there ought to be something different about us. See, our example, our testimony may not even just be word of mouth. It may just be in the way we live. And it should be that way. It should be that when they come to us, or they're just around us, there's something different about you. Something that they can point and say, That guy never curses once. What is wrong with him? I don't know if anybody's ever had that problem, but it is a weird thing in today's age where that is the thing that you're known for. It's commonplace. It's commonplace. And even the smallest thing like that can show people that there is something about you that is different. Again, in verse 11... John chapter 4. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? She was curious. What are you talking about? Let's go on to John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. 
And then we skip down to verse 25, just for time's sake here. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. See, the woman perceives that there's something different. There's a substance to Jesus' claim here. We'll go before that. He started talking about how, bring your husband. She's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, right, you got a lot. <laughs> you have a lot. And she's stunned. Again, stranger, how does he even know this? How does he even know? And she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Again, the words go on for time's sake. I'm just going to skip down here. And she says, when the Messiah comes, he's going to teach us all things. And what does Jesus say for all the people out there that say Jesus never claimed to be God? I am he. I am he. I am he. See, there's a substance to it. And what's a little bit funny, if you go back to our scripture a little bit, you'll notice when he said something about the... uh, when Christ tells her that, that what you're drinking here is useless, basically this is just water. I've got better water. Her response is, are you saying this isn't good enough? This is what we've drank since Jacob. Our father's fathers have drank from this well. And he's trying to tell her, I, ha- I have something better for you. Again, when we talk to people, When we witness to people, we ought to do it, again, in love as Christ does it. And with that love to say, but there's something better for you. There's something out there that's much more valuable than what you even can understand and fathom. And for a lot of us, we've gotten discouraged because we've tried and we've tried and we've tried. And we think, what is it that I'm not doing right? And then you stop and you give up, right? How many of us in here could raise our hands? I'm not asking you to do it, but raise your hand in, in agreement to say, in a lot of cases, or maybe with a couple people, you've just given up. You stop praying for them. You stop trying to witness to them because you think, I'm not seeing any change. But I'm telling you again, that's not the point. The point isn't that you are going to change anything. The point is that you just keep telling them there's something that is more valuable. You tell them the good news. And they're going to notice. They're going to notice there's something different. They're going to notice there's a substance to your claim, as the woman noticed with Christ's claim. See, she noticed that there's something different and finds quickly there is actually credibility in Jesus himself. He was able to say things to her that nobody else would know. At least not a stranger. And Christians, we find we have to be salt and light have to have flavor, something to us that when people look, they say, what is that? They are different. How do you go through trials in life and still have joy and contentment? How come you're okay in the position you are in? These are the people ought to be asking, and it's not in your might, and that's the point. I have something, a substance that keeps me in that place. And that is the lesson we're learning here in John chapter 4. We're learning that from the drawing of our own well, that is where we get our substance. And the Samaritan asked Jesus to give her this source. See, now she's hooked. There's something there and she wants it. And Jesus reveals, I am he. See, Jesus revealed he is that well of living water. And for us, we know, for Christians, we know that's true. Amen? What else do we need? Again, I always want us to remember who we were before Christ. And I want to ask, would you ever go back? Would you ever go back? No. I think we honestly could tell ourselves it was worth nothing, wasn't it? Everything before. Everything before we knew Christ was worth nothing. Would you have a clue? Answer me. Would you have a clue before knowing Christ what you were getting before you got him? No. But you knew there was something different. You knew you needed it. And once you took a taste of it, there was nothing more worth it. 
I think that's what's missing in our lives. I think that's what's missing in Christian lives. As we were talking this morning again about this possible revival that may be happening, and you have to wonder, and we pray all the time for revival. We need revival in our own hearts. If we want to see revival, there's no revival in a country or, or in a city or a state when there's not a revival in the hearts of the individual Christian. And how do we get that? How do we get that? We have to remember who we are serving. We have to remember our source of life. And Jesus says, I am that source. Jeremiah chapter 2. And you can follow along with me, but I'm going to be pretty quick about this. Jeremiah chapter 2. He's talking to, about Israel here. But if there's something profound when you we're talking about the well of living water. And I'm going to be starting in verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. See, the prophet Jeremiah, God is speaking through him and is saying... What country even changes their God? They don't change their gods, do they? Usually you go to a place and what, do they just change those overnight? No, most countries, if you go to today, and their religions have been there with them for thousands of years. They don't just change it on a whim. And they say, but Israel changed their glory, God, for meaningless stuff. And what does he say further? He says, my people committed two evils that they have forsaken me. And he says, the fountain of living waters. God calls himself in the Old Testament, the fountain of living waters. And what did they do? They hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. See, what they had done is they replaced God with something that was empty and had no substance whatsoever. Because anything other than God is worthless. Amen. Everything else that is not God and not of his kingdom is worthless. There is no other replacement. And many people have empty cisterns and are thirsty. Many people. How many people, again, thinking of the woman at the well and thinking of our own lives, when we are out and about and yet we see so many people surrounding us that are lost and dying and have no clue. And yet we don't take time to interrupt their day. If somebody didn't interrupt our time and our lives and our day, would we possibly be here today? Who knows, right? In all honesty, if somebody didn't take the time to present the gospel to one of us, where would we be? And that's something that we ought to think to ourselves. So see, we want revival in our hearts. We have to remember, our, again, our condition. We have to remember where we were. We have to remember when Christ came to us and what he presented to us and how amazing it was and still is. And we have to not forget all the things around us because all the other things have no substance. And in Jeremiah, God called himself the living water. And so when Christ told the Samaritan woman, I have the well of living water. And she asked, where do I get it? And he says, I am he. Again, to the odd theologians who propose that God never, or Christ never said that he was God. Please read your Bible. Please read your Bible. He said it right here. He said, I am the well of living water. I am he. See, Christ is everything. Christ is all. And without Christ, we would still be in our sins. Without Christ, we'd still be on our way to hell. 
Without Christ, we would have no sacrifice. But yet we do. And we can rejoice in that. And again, we've tasted of it, right? We know it, and it's sweet. And it's what keeps us going and going and going each and day, and it should be. But sometimes we get forgetful. John chapter 4, back to John, in verse 27. I'm skipping down a little bit here. Again, for time's sake. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Messiah? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have no food to eat that you do not that you do not know about. What we find here in these verses is that now she has spent time with Jesus. She has the source. See, it was no longer something she, she how quickly this transpired, by the way. Again, that's why I think this is one of the greatest accounts, how quickly this happens. She's going through her life, again, at noonday, because she had many husbands, was very ashamed. We want to know why she was there at noon when nobody else was. She was ashamed for what she was doing. She probably was pretty well known, at least in that, that town, what she was doing, and they knew it was wrong, and she knew it was wrong. She was living in sin, ashamed, probably couldn't get away from it at that point. And yet Christ had something to do with her. She had no clue what she really needed, but Christ did. And once she found out what she found Christ himself, now she had the source. Now she had something. And she got so excited. It produced a profound response, didn't it? So profound, she ran off to talk to all the people that she was afraid of hiding from, right? She's at noonday trying to hide from the townspeople. Well, she wasn't afraid anymore, was she? Why? Because when Christ comes to us, when Christ comes to us, he covers our sins. We no longer have to be ashamed. It is something wrong we did, but we never have to live with the shame of it because Christ has forgiven us. And if Christ has forgiven us, who can judge us? If Christ has forgiven us, who can condemn us? Which is what that word means when we talk about judgment. I hear a lot of, you can't judge me. Well, I can still evaluate. <laughs> I can't condemn you. You're right. That's what that means. I can still evaluate. Sin is sin. Now, this woman has a profound response. Not only does she run to the very people she's trying to hide from, but she forgot about the water she came for in the first place. She left the jar. Why? It was meaningless. She had what she needed now. She didn't. She didn't know, but now she does. And so her profound response, she forgot her jar of water, her empty cistern, if you will, to share with others the value of Christ. Now she had this source. Now she had the well of living water. And others came because of why? Her overflow. Her overflow. Notice the disciples marveled at Jesus with the woman. And see, as Christians, others' need for the source should overwhelm us. See, we shouldn't marvel when we take time with other people who aren't Christians. Shouldn't marvel when other people take time out of their way to go with people who aren't of the family of Christ. We shouldn't marvel at that. The disciples did. It was strange. It was strange they were even in that place in the first place. But notice they didn't say anything. They didn't ask him anything. They didn't say anything about it. They let Christ do the work. And that's something important for us to learn too. Again, I'm speaking about the children. I'm speaking about myself. Speaking when we witness to others, it's not in our power. 
Notice, we may point out that they have a need, but it's up to the source to do the rest. See, it's not in my power. If I go and witness to somebody, yes, oh, there's something different about you, but what's that different about me? It's not me, it's Christ. And that's the overflow I'm talking about here. See, we should have such an abounding love for Christ and a deep relationship with Him that He flows from our hearts, our very lives in a way, again, that people say, what is this? What is different? And it should be good for them enough to say, I want that. In John chapter 4, verse 39, getting close to closing here. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. See, they no longer believed due to the Samaritan woman's overflow. They didn't just believe because of what she had told them. It wasn't just her testimony now, her testimony. See, it's important for us to give testimony so others can see what Christ has done in our lives, the transforming power of the living well of water. But it's also important for them, which is why Christ says to disciple them along the way, but it's important for them to grab and dig their own well too. What do you mean by that, Colton? They have to have a relationship with Christ. Nobody can ride on the curtails of your own faith. And that's what you see in a lot of Christian families and homes in our society today is what's happened is there's Christian families, but all it is is the children never believed in what the parents believed. And the parents really didn't maybe do a great job of really raising and teaching them and how to go. You want to know how to keep your kids, you have to do it at home yourself. Sunday school for us, I know I preached on this last year about it. I would rather get rid of Sunday school for, for the kids. <gasps> I would never do that. But if it got in the way of you doing your responsibility, then I would. I can't replace the home. The example is you. And some of you say, well, the parents aren't really there. I'm just the grandparent. You've got to be the example too. You have to be. We have to be for our family and for our children. And you know what? When they look at you and they see the overflow, and I'm speaking from personal experience, my grandfather, who I love dearly, one of the only father figures in my life, I honestly almost never knew that he was a Christian. Not because he didn't talk about Jesus, but he just never said, I'm a Christian. He always quoted Bible verses. It was just on him. He was always generous and loving and kind. And you know, Come to find out when he had passed away how many times I ended up thinking about how I wanted to be a man like that who served God, who didn't have to just go around and say, I'm a Christian, pretending and saying, well, let me put this air on that you know I'm a Christian, but just live the life of Christ and where others said, wow, he was different. And it wasn't because of him. In fact, at his funeral, he is... His brother actually said, it's like, it's because he's a Christian. He loves Christ. Come to find out when I got his Bible, this huge thing in the notes, I say he knew the Bible probably better than I've, than a lot of people I ever knew knew. But you really wouldn't have known it. But he had a close relationship with Christ. He had a close relationship with him. And my hope and desire for all of us is we too have that close relationship. Because if we don't, you can't have that overflow. You can't have that thing where others look and say, what is different? What do you have? When I'm not drawing near to Christ, he doesn't draw near to me. It only works when I draw near to him that he draws near to me. If you want to draw from the living water, 
He promises once you do that, he's coming to you. And when we do that, we also become fruitful. Again, the Samaritan woman's overflow, they didn't believe that anymore. They didn't need that. They didn't need her testimony. Why? Because they had their own testimony. They had dug their own well. Proverbs 5, 15 through 17. Drink from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your streams be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be free, be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Again, in the home and Christian's family, your kids, your grandchildren, they can't ride on the curtails. Kids, you can't ride on your parents' faith. That's not what's going to get you to heaven. It's going to be your own. You have to have your own relationship. And to do that, you have to draw into the source so that you too will be able to show and teach others to dig their own source, to teach a man a fish, right? In James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And in conclusion here, there is a need that most do not know they even have. The question is, do, does your own well, does Christ overflow through you, through your heart and your life? Can they taste a portion of Christ in your life? When they perceive the need, it is actually our job that we point to that source and show them a bit more of Jesus, of his word and prayer and love and truth. There's so many people today. I got that so many. You see that they'll point out the sin, but they don't do it with love. And once they find the spring of living water, it should, as it did with us, change our lives. And we should be ready to show others how to dig and draw from the well of living water of God, of Christ, and from his word. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again just for the great and awesome God that you are. You proclaimed it. You said your you are the well, the fountain of living water. Lord, how sweet you are. And Lord, for us as Christians, we know how sweet you are. I would ask, Father, we've, we've prayed so many times for revival in our country, but God, revive our hearts. God, revive our lives. Help us to remember there is a spring in front of us. It's you, God. Remember, Lord, the sweet first taste that we have. Lord, when we came to know you and your salvation. Lord, help us. And help us to pass it on. Help us to be a witness and testimony to others. Help us, God, to do it with love and truth and sincerity. Again, with Christ in our hearts. To be fruitful Christians. And Father, I pray if anybody here doesn't know you, Lord, has not tasted of the well, Lord, it would be that first day. And Lord, that they would begin to draw from you because you promised that you would draw near to us. And Lord, we thank you for your great faithfulness and love and that you don't leave us nor forsake us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.